Greetings everyone, hope you're having a meaningful day. This is our second part of the Socratic Dialogue series and in this video we are going to be discussing the principles of Socratic Dialogue as they are incorporated into Logotherapy from our practice. These principles should not be taken as hard and fast rules but more as general guidelines and one way of incorporating philosophy into psychotherapy. Before we dive into the process, let's move with the understanding that Socratic Dialogue isn't a debate. The point here isn't to win an argument or win anything, but it is to help each other catch contradictions, clarify concepts, examine positions and reflect. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. One of the best ways to experience this process is to do it in a group or with a friend. You can try it out by taking the exercises we will outline in the following principles and give them a whirl with a friend or maybe in the comment section of this video. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So with that, we start with the first principles, which we'd like to call self-knowledge. We often go through life thinking we know ourselves, such as knowing in the present what we want, what we feel, how we feel and behave, and even extend it to the future as well. However, especially in therapy, we often come across the opposite being true. Haven't you come across a time in your life where you behaved in a way that you never expected yourself to? This ties into the logotherapeutic position that the self is a process and not a state. So let's unpack this. Dr. Viktor Frankl echoed the existentialist position that existing or being yourself is a process of becoming, meaning that there would always be a gap between who you want to be and who you are. And that's not a bad thing, but the ideal state because fulfilling this gap is exactly what makes our efforts enjoyable and have meaning. Think about a tough exam you passed after countless hours of effort. But what if it was easy? Would you have felt the same fulfillment? The issues here arrive when this process is outside of our awareness or we become impatient and frustrated with it. The Socratic tradition addresses this lack of awareness by treating yourself as if you don't know yourself. How would you acquaint with yourself? What questions would you ask to get to know a person? Why not answer those questions yourself? To get a taste of this principle, try this exercise. Think back to a difficult life choice you had to make, such as maybe moving to another city or choosing your major in college or any choice you had to make with high personal stakes. What were your choices? What did you end up choosing? Why did you make that call? Are you content with the decisions you took? If you are, then please elaborate why. And if you aren't, then try to elaborate why aren't you? We would love to hear your experiences in the comments if you feel comfortable sharing them. With that, we come over to the next principle that is of the right questions. Nietzsche commended Socrates by saying, Socrates teaches you how to listen. The power of philosophy is not in the answers we get, but in knowing the right questions to ask. Think about it. Are not most biases unquestioned assumptions? Maybe they persist because we have never thought of asking the right questions. You can see this in the famous quote by Socrates himself, an unexamined life is not worth living. For Socrates, the lapse often comes because we just assume things to be true and don't examine them. Many of our defining moments are when we face the right but often difficult questions, especially when we have to defend the answers we come up with. As an example, take addiction. It is a very hard thing to come out of and often, sadly, well-intentioned friends and well-wishers can derail those efforts. For instance, if you are quitting smoking, but all of your friends are smokers, then every time you are near them, they may be offering you a cigarette. Perhaps not because they don't want you to stop smoking, but because they think that's what a friend should do. In this scenario, are they truly being a good friend? Are you being a good friend by not sharing that you feel tempted every time? Should not friends easily share and support? This is where our concept of a friend needs careful examination. So as an exercise, try this. Think of an open-ended question about something that is usually assumed to be true, such as, friends always help friends. One should never lie. It's always better to do what you love or what fulfills you or something else you can identify. Now, whatever statement that you've chosen, assume the opposite to be true, hypothetically. Can you look for scenarios in which this opposition can hold to be the right one? Can you justify or defend these positions? By doing this, you are carefully examining these concepts in your mind and coming up with clearer versions of them because you are asking the right questions. And this brings up to our next principle as well, that is thinking for yourself. The end goal of therapy is to enable clients to think for themselves. 
In fact, it is a good indicator if the therapy is going well or not. One manner in the Socratic tradition to know if one's thinking is sound is to see if it is free of contradictions, as two contradictory things cannot be true. In fact, in the formal study of logic, this is one way to prove if something is logically true or not. As an example, have you ever seen someone who is clearly angry and agitated and when they are asked to calm down, they scream, I am calm. This is clearly a contradiction. Can you be calm when you are visibly frustrated or agitated? The next question that naturally arises is what to do with these contradictions. And that's the whole point. In real life, there will always be contradictions. What is important is how we deal with them, either in resolution or alternatively, how we work with them. And this is what would lead you to your logos. As an example, I'd like to share a case with you. I once had a client who had been diagnosed with lung issues and had to stop smoking. I asked my client if he had close friends or family for support. As one of the determining factors for the success of addiction treatment is the presence of a robust social support system. He lived far away from his family but proudly stated that he had many friends at his workplace. However, as we progressed in therapy, he kept succumbing to his addiction and his health kept suffering as a result. In all these situations, he had been in a gathering which had led him to smoke. And delving deeper into these episodes, we ended up discussing his friends. Their attitude showed quite an interesting pattern. They would often mock him for having weak lungs and would often say, Would you refuse a friend in order to get him to share a smoke with them? When I asked him about it, he would chuckle and say, Isn't that what friends do? This is where we started a Socratic dialogue. He ended up concluding that they were actually his colleagues and not really his friends. Because the state of his health seemed to be having no impact on their behavior. He seemed particularly surprised when I asked him how would he be behaving if one of them was the one whose lungs were getting damaged beyond repair. And he promptly said that he would never smoke in front of that person because he realized how much of a toll it took to constantly resist. Here the issue is not the quality of his company but the concept of friendship he had and asking the right questions was fundamental in steering his recovery. As an exercise, try the following. Take any position on an issue that has seen such disagreement in your personal experience. Can you come up with both for and against statements for it? Then try to find out if you can point any contradictions from both these positions. And here we come on to the next principle that is of non-conformity. Another major aim of therapy is to enable clients or patients to be able to navigate the complexities of life themselves. How can we be sure that our thoughts are truly our own? You may let the evidence guide your thinking, but then try to take a look at any divisive issue in your country. You will find some form of evidence for nearly all points of view. The second option can be to see what others are thinking. But then again, are you not adopting their thinking rather than coming up with your own thoughts? In such cases, philosophical reflection is the answer. If we take Socrates as an example, then he was a thinker who trusted his reason, intellect, just as much as his intuition for the practice of reflection would lead him to the right way in any case. However, what is required and much harder to come by is the patience. A good example of this is a major life decision such as choosing a job for instance. A person goes through years of education but is expected that they instantly procure employment or know what they want to do with their life. But why is that assumed to be so? Is this because we are not taught how to think for ourselves and are reliant on others to do it for us? I'd like to illustrate this by an example of a friend. He had graduated with an engineering degree but lately had been experiencing depression. He talked to me more as a friend and started discussing his condition. It turned out he had developed it ever since he had been going to the university and it had gotten particularly bad ever since he had joined his job. I simply asked him why doesn't he quit? He answered because it's the best paying job in his field. I asked him then why doesn't he quit his field? He answered it was because he had studied for it. I asked why did he study for it then? He answered because his parents really wanted him to. I just observed then he had done his part. He had studied what they had wanted but that did not necessarily mean that he had to make a career out of it. And in doing so, even though he was paid handsomely, it did not seem to give him a sense of fulfillment. The point really hit him. And in the next couple of months, he quit his job and opened up a burger stand because that was something he really enjoyed and ended up earning more than what he was earning at his job. 
It took his parents a long time to accept his decision. But the point here is to focus on is that even though there was evidence for his studies landing him in financial security, the studies and the job were never his own decision to begin with because he did not choose them. This is what nonconformity can do. It isn't a posing popular option for the sake of it. That is being different just for the sake of being different. But knowing exactly why, because in itself, Neither conformity nor non-conformity are bad things, but decisions without insight often are. Try this exercise. Take any hard decision in your or someone else's personal experience. What was the problem and how was it resolved? Then in the resolution, try to explore the basis of the foundations of their resolution. How much of these foundations were truly your own or their own thinking and how much of it was influenced by other people? And with this, we come up to the most important one of the principles, and that is of soulful truths. The alignment of one's beliefs, thinking, and behaviors are the best route to contentment according to the Socratic tradition. When we are fully aware of our limitations and have the courage to speak them, then the path to truth is liberating. Interestingly, Freud recognized that we hurt ourselves the most when we lie to ourselves. The synchrony of belief, thinking and behaviors has been worked on by many CBT practitioners and is a prominent feature in the works of Carl Jung as well. As an example, take health, for instance. How many people forgo a simple walk routine in order to go for an intense exercise program that never seems to start? Are we truly working on our health or chasing an unhealthy beauty standard that we know is not good for us? Should perfection impede that which is good? For Socrates, being truthful, especially to oneself and others, helps us in establishing the synchronicity of the soul. By using the Socratic tradition, both philosophically and as a logotherapeutic tool to decipher the meaning we wish to pursue, it can lead us to a more fulfilling and contented life. We really hope that you enjoyed this video. We really appreciate the subscribers we are getting. Please drop us some feedback as to what else would you like us to cover. One of the best things about starting this channel has been the interaction with people across the world. We sincerely hope that you have a meaningful day. Thank you so much once again.